I always remember right at the scene, we are recording it. We will also have um, another webinar that Kelly's doing on Thursday of the same content. So we can also do the recording then. We'll make one of those available. Um, so no worries about taking any notes. We'll be happy to make the recording available to you. But we'll first discuss in this webinar what inquiry is and how it can help you meet NGSS and Common Core standards. Then we'll discover citizen science projects in ornithology and beyond. And we'll finish by reviewing case studies from educators that have used the scientific process through observation and asking questions. So let's get you guys thinking. I know it's end of the day, my brain is a little brain dead, but let's keep that discussion going. When you hear the word inquiry, what do you think of? So in that chat one, I want you to ask her, what is inquiry? Asking questions, absolutely. <clears throat> Finding answers to questions, questioning something, investigating, wondering and asking questions, asking questions. Yeah, so questions is a big part of inquiry. Now, how many of you use inquiry in your educational setting? Yes, not often, okay. Good, it seems like a lot of people are really trying to use inquiry. Uh, for those of you who don't or maybe unsure of inquiry, we're gonna try and break that down for you here and talk about how you can further improve your inquiry skills, but also incorporate citizen science into those inquiry um, opportunities in your classroom or educational setting. So inquiry is a buzzword. But it's evolved its meaning through time. Back in school, I learned inquiry through the linear scientific method of ask questions, construct a hypothesis, test your hypothesis, analyze, and there's your results right there. It's a very linear method. And the definition in the top left corner defines inquiry as an act of asking for information or an official investigation. Now, to Bird Sleuth, inquiry isn't official or linear. Instead, inquiry provides an authentic science learning process. We like to highlight three points when thinking about inquiry. First and foremost, inquiry is all about students asking and answering their own questions. Many of you have already said that in the chat window. So questions are a way to understand our world. And questioning is central to learning and growing. Teachers often comment that taking kids outside for observation is a great way to motivate students to ask questions in science. Observations are the foundation for inquiry. So from those observations, authentic scientific learning can flourish by asking and answering those questions. Now the next big component to inquiry is to allow project-based learning. Once students start to make observations, Questions naturally arise. Encourage those questions. We can't emphasize this enough that questions are good, especially if you as the educator don't know the answer to their questions. This provides the opportunity to have students answer their own questions through project-based learning. If kids are curious which plants will attract more butterflies, have them investigate it. Plant a variety of butterfly plants and then have students create their own experiment to find the answer. <clears throat> and ultimately with inquiry, this process of observing, asking, and investigating inherently meets the next generation science standards with asking questions, planning and carrying out investigations, analyzing and interpreting data, using computational thinking, and so on. So when we think of inquiry, it's not a linear process or just a feedback loop that goes in a circle. It is a very complex web. Now this image of the science process is actually a, a mini poster that's in our resource investigating evidence that we'll be focusing on today. And you can see it goes from anywhere of making observations to posing questions. From those questions, you can look at references and draw conclusions or you can design an experiment or just collect and analyze data, and then you can go back to asking more questions, you can create results, 
You can make even more observations. It truly is a very complex web. And this is what authentic scientific learning looks like. So we're trying to model not just a cookie cutter, this is what the answer is supposed to be, but what scientists actually go through. Now, in our main resources that teaches this content, um, investigating evidence, it focuses on student inquiry through citizen science. Now, citizen science was in the Lab of Ornithology's mission. It's in Bird Sleuth's mission. But can anybody provide me thoughts or examples of citizen science in the chat window? Everyday people making observations and collecting and sharing data. Ellen, you took the words right from my mouth. That's absolutely right. Has anybody participated in citizen science? Some yeses, some noes. Wow, a lot of yeses then. So which citizen science projects have you all participated in? We all do without even knowing it. That's great, Travis. I like that. eBird, great sunflower project. eBird as well, great backyard bird count. Yeah, Galaxy Zoo, I'll have to check in on that one. I wonder if that's a Zooniverse one. Bird count, that's great. Okay, yeah, Zooniverse does have some great, I highly recommend Zooniverse as a starting point. Nest Watch, eMammal, wonderful. <clears throat> well, when we think of citizen science projects, uh, we think of people everywhere who are using basic scientific protocols to report observations on the natural world around them. And it's truly a partnership that you, your youth, the kids, um, and the scientists are able to answer real world questions. Now this can happen across a wide range of project types as you guys have talked about in the chat window. And this can be in any research context you can think of. The best part about the investigating evidence resource that we'll be talking about is that it isn't bird specific. To our chagrin, it's not bird specific. But the nice thing is it just breaks down the process of inquiry, but it can be applied to any subject. So each lesson will have recommendations on projects around birds, mammals, insects, phenology, and weather. Uh, projects offer ready-made research opportunities. Sometimes they can be completely online or completely outdoors. You can do everything as a one-time observation or really go into that full force investigation. And it's all about supporting learning and inquiry with citizen science. Now, at the Lab of Ornithology, of course, we always encourage you to look at some of our citizen science projects. I saw we had some eBirders, Great Backyard Bird Count people. Uh, we have six citizen science projects eBird is our largest citizen science project. It's every single country around the world with roughly 95% of the birds seen, uh, bird species known that have been reported into eBird. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but if you have any interest in getting involved with citizen science, we do have a lot of great resources and highly recommend birds as a wonderful starting point. So why choose citizen science as a tool to foster inquiry? First of all, it's fun and it's real world. Again, it's all about answering real world questions. It provides the students the opportunity to study wild animals or galaxies, even plants. Uh, it teaches STEM content and it builds science skills. So to touch more on that, citizen science and the investigation that it it can inspire will invite students to participate in the science process. Through these experiences, students will develop their understanding of the big picture cross-cutting concepts and discover science content. Again, students conducting investigations will learn those science process skills and big picture ideas found in the cross-cutting concepts and practices, but the science content they learn will depend on the focus of their studies. 
So along with the teaching STEM content and building, citizen science motivates kids to get engaged further with science in their studies. It will connect them to their scientific community. The wonderful thing about eBird and a lot of our citizen science projects is, say your, your students may submit an unusual bird sighting. It actually connects them to local birders in their area, and that provides and opens the door to a wonderful discussion opportunity. Uh, citizen science will spark kids' curiosity. As soon as you put a bird feeder up outside a classroom window, automatically the observations and the questions just start flowing out of them. And did I mention again that it's fun. Citizen science gets kids active and excited about science. A great quote from this teacher is, I learned that taking them outside and letting them do bird observations was a great way to motivate them to ask questions in science. So questions naturally arise, and that's really what the big take-home message is. Now let's discuss investigating evidence and how you can foster these observations and questions that we're really focusing on here. In lesson one of investigating evidence curriculum, we set the premise that scientific investigations begin with observations and questions. That lesson really encourages students to explore their environment and ask their own questions. They also read about practicing scientists and discover the components of investigations and ways to answer scientific questions. So how do you first get kids to even observe? Do you guys have any activities or strategies that work for you? I welcome you to share those in the chat window if you have any um, fun, quick activities that help kids get outside to work on those observation skills. For bird sleuth, we recommend doing a sound map to simply warm up those observation skills. We take the kids outside with a piece of paper and a writing utensil, have them sit down quietly, and then just listen. As they listen, we have them draw or write, write what they hear. Um, and we have them, when they're doing that, they're creating a sound map. So if you like this activity, you can actually find the sound map activity in the Birds with Explorers guidebook, which is a free download on our website. But once students start to make these observations, the questions are naturally arising. So looking at what some people have put in the chat window, sensory organizers, they've set up a feeding station at their school, Visiting a bird sanctuary often. Mary's use a sound map before Katie's use a sound map. Looking at aquatic macroinvertebrates. Oh, I love that, Karen. I'm originally a marine biology major myself and have taught stream aquatology quite often. You get them engaged by getting down on their fours and crawl around to try and get close. Love that, Travis. Have a short checklist of things to look for, then sketch and describe what they found. Oh, wonderful, you guys, this is great. And then Gwen, you can find the sound map uh, when a Birds of Explorers guidebook. So Kelly is going to share the link to that right now in our link. It's just a free download and it's one of the first activities in that book. Kelly actually developed it. It's an association with the um, Federal Initiative of Every Kid in the Park. So it's designed for the fourth grade age, but the nice thing is it has a page dedicated to a sound map where Kids truly just decide uh, how they're going to represent what they're hearing. And it's wonderful just to have them start closing their eyes and just listening. So again, when I lead a walk outside, my group often finds and notices some very unusual, curious things. And I'm sure if you guys have ever led kids outside, you've probably seen the same. Now, let's focus on our friend, the pigeon here, and discuss how to foster observations and questions. Now, you may encounter some unusual things like this image. Now, looking at this pigeon, when I happen upon these question generators, I think my approach can either encourage curiosity and deeper thinking with open-ended questions, or I can shut down the natural process with closed-ended questions. 
If I make a statement such as, look at that pigeon drinking, I've told you what I've seen as a fact and basically closed off further discourse. I could invite you to observe with me the uh, questions such as, <clears throat> what species is that? Um, but this is a question with one right answer, so it's a closed question. If you don't know the answer, it may make you feel unwelcome to participate. Uh, it, I could open up more by saying, what clues could I use to identify the species? I can invite discussion with a question such as, what is that bird doing? And this is opening that discussion. Um, or even further, I could ask an opinion. Why do you think the bird is doing that? I can begin to get science content and invite discussion by asking questions such as, how do birds survive in cities? And I can get even further by talking about experiments and saying, will birds drink from fountains? Or will putting out a bird bath attract birds? Now that's something I might actually want to test. And as educators, skillful questioning can invite children to pursue their own curiosity about how the world works. It helps us to foster high level discussions and support deeper thinking. So once students start to make observations and start to ask questions, their observations can be sorted based on the types of questions they're asking. For example, the last question I just asked about the pigeon, will putting out a bird bath attract birds, can either be an observational or experimental study based on how the student designs it. Now, a common question type by students is a reference question. Oh, yeah, is that better? Okay. Whoop. Thank you. Um, now, a common question type by students is a reference question. So this is meaning they can simply refer to a reference materials and find the answer to their question. That's down at the bottom. Uh, an example of this would be, how far does an Arctic turn migrate? You can simply put that question into Google and it will immediately tell me the answer of 44,000 miles. It's a very simple reference question. Think of those as Google questions. Now these are great and they're not bad. They're starting off that inquiry process. But we want kids to dig deeper and ask more complex questions that lead to data analysis and conducting their own experiments and studies. So how many of you have observed or heard about birds that attack the reflections in a mirror or window? This can lead, oh goodness, let me just minimize that, is that better? Okay, um, this can lead to a student saying something like, I'm wondering about cardinal and how territorial they can be. So let me challenge you. Using the chat window, how can you reword this student's statement into an experimental question? Why are birds territorial? So again, the challenge is taking this statement and making it into an experimental question. So when we think about experimental questions, some, con some background knowledge would be, typically you need to have variables um, that you can manipulate or test. That would be for an experimental question. We can also think about observational questions. So having students go outside and actually observe different scenarios and comparing what they're seeing. So will cardinals attack other cardinals that are come into the area? That could be an observational. Looking at Barbara and Ellen's two questions of why are birds territorial and are all birds territorial? This might be more of a reference question. How do birds respond when they hear the song of their own species? Absolutely, Katie. That can easily be a question where you do a control of not playing any songs and then play a cardinal song to try and hear how they respond. Will cardinals respond to different types of decoys? Uh, yes, that's a great one, Karen. How can we tell that cardinals are territorial? That's an interesting question, Lisa. And that's one where, that's often a question that scientists will answer, or ask, I should say, but it goes down to a deeper level, one that I think will be a bit more complex than what students can do. Um, but it does bring a different, different level of questions 
where it would eventually be an experimental question, but outside the realm of this discussion, if that makes sense. So looking at some of the questions you guys had, we just decided to come up with our own answer. And one sample could be, will a cardinal react more aggressively to a decoy, a recorded song, or a singing decoy, which is actually a combination of some of the questions you guys had. And we could create this into an experiment, especially for older students. This is uh, activity right here of giving a statement and translating that into um, a question for an experiment or observational study is a really great and I'm sure, as you've realized, a challenging activity to do. Um, but that's what's necessary, especially for the older students, to start translating those reference questions into deeper questions to help dig into those experimental studies. So here's a sample question that Amy, a fourth grader, has asked, which was published in our 2005 Birdsooth Investigator student research magazine. So Amy noticed that when her neighbor's cat was out, she thought she saw fewer birds at her family's feeder. Again, she's making this observation, and questions naturally arise with those observations. So she wanted to test a question and wondered if a fake cat would scare away birds. So Amy put a couple feeders in a tree, one with sunflower seeds and one with mixed seed, and measured the amount of seed that was taken over one week. She then refilled the feeders and put a stuffed cat in the tree as the guard. And then the graft came, and can you tell what Amy's experiment did? Amy decided that the cat was a good guard. And so she actually had her results published in 2005 issue of Birds and Investigator. Without the cat, three and a half cups of seed were eaten, whereas with the cat, only half a cup of seed was eaten. So just like a real scientist, Amy didn't just make her conclusions or stop there. She said the cat is good guard, but she went further proposing new questions that she or other students could do. She started, or she stated that she was surprised that the birds did not seem to learn that the cat was not real. She wondered how long it would take for the birds to learn the cat wasn't a threat. And she was going to set up a new observational study to find out, so she predicted over time that the cups of seed eaten would actually increase because the birds would learn the cat was fake. This is exactly the kind of science and authentic inquiry we want to support of taking that observation, asking a question, designing their own experiment, and uh, publishing those results in our student publication magazine. To help encourage this question asking process, we encourage you as an educator to keep track of student questions on what we call an I Wonder board. And this is implement, uh, this is embedded within that investigating evidence curriculum. Some teachers give each student a stack of post-its, and when they think of a question, they put it on a board. This way, questions don't get lost in times of, you might say, you know, that's a great question, Johnny, but we'll get back to that later. And you know what? Oftentimes, we forget to get back to that later. This provides that opportunity of not forgetting, writing it down, and putting it on our I Wonder board. The best part is, is when inquiry and question opportunities come or it's time for kids to design their own experiment, they can go right back to that I Wonder board and see what questions they want to design an experiment on. So it's a good, a good base for all this inquiry. Now in the investigating evidence curriculum, much of what we discussed is explained either through PowerPoints within the um, teacher handouts around um, kinds of questions, developing hypotheses, variables, and so forth. So for the rest of the webinar, I'd really like to explore some of the case studies of questions and experiments that students have asked and how they've answered them. So at first, I want to truly start with experiments. And experimental studies are questions that require kids to manipulate a variable and see what happens. This is what Amy did with the fake cat situation. She manip manipulated the variable of the fake cat being present or not. So let's just get a brief example and a very birdie example. If a student wanted to determine 
whether feet or color has an effect, she might suggest if I put a red, blue, and green feeder out, birds will visit the green feeder more. And this could be her hypothesis. She might speculate that the green feeder, being the most camouflaged or natural looking, might be visited the most. Now, these experimental studies require students to identify an independent variable that they'll change, a dependent variable which will be measured, and a control variable so that students only study the correct variables that they want to. So in this birdie example of bird feeder colors, we have our control variables. These are the location of the feeders, the type of feeder used, the type of seed used. Other factors that can be considered are the time of day. For example, we don't want to measure the red and blue feeder amount in the morning and the green feeder in the evening. Weather is another factor to be taken into consideration. We don't want to measure the red feeder on Tuesday when it rains, the blue feeder on a Wednesday when it snows, and then the green feeder on a Thursday when it's sunshine and 50 degrees out. So our independent variables are the variables we change. And this is where we want to make sure that again, those red, blue, and green variables, those variables that we change, are the only variables that are changing, not the constants. And finally, our dependent variables, or the variables we will be measuring, will be the amount of seed. A student example of this is actually the fledgling ornithologists, and they did something exactly around this. Will birds prefer a blue, red, or yellow feeder? Simply by creating their own feeders, regularly measuring the amount of CD, and you can see that in the bottom photos there, um, and doing regular observations so there are multiple data points. This is helping the kids actually create a solid uh, experimental study. Now, observational questions lead to observational studies where students make observations and collect their own data but they're not changing any variables. Even little kids can conduct studies. These second graders who wondered if snow depth would affect the number of birds that visited their feeder decided to create their own study. Now the best part of this experiment or this observational study that they've done is that they didn't need to be able to identify every single bird that visited their bird feeder. All they need to do was practice their measuring skills to measure the depth of snow and be able to count the number of birds that visited their bird feeder. As we can look at their uh, graph up at the top, we can see that the depth of snow really doesn't seem to affect the number of birds during this study. Another example of an observational study is will suet attract insectivorous species? And then finally, one of my personal favorites is the idea of where will curiosity leave? So I would love to show you this quick video. And I hope this, oh, this, it's just a nine second video. It's not important the sound works. Oh, make sure I can actually play it. Now that smile at the end is precious. So this is Alyssa, and she decided that why couldn't she have a bird eat out of her hand? She really wanted to have one. And so she designed an experimental study where she, or an observational study, I should say, where she put out a pumpkin, she, let the pumpkin look like a human with the sunglasses, the hat, the clothing, and just had bird seed right in her hand. And after a couple of weeks, when that was, the bird started eating out of the pumpkin's hand, she decided to replace that dummy, and magic happened. And she had a tuft of titmousey right out of her hand, and the smile tells it all of how adorable that is. So, Observational studies are another great way to have kids work on focusing less on the variables and just developing those observational skills. 
And the final type of uh, activity I'd like to talk to you guys about is the data exploration. And this is all about kids who are being able to answer their own questions by analyzing data on large databases. And this is especially important with citizen science databases. So we're gonna use eBird as our example. Again, eBird is the lab's largest citizen science project. And if not, it's one of the largest in the world. So we've had bird observations from every single country, millions of hours of volunteer hours committed to uh, observing bird. And the best part is, you, whether you're a scientist, a kid, a retired person, anybody, you can submit bird observations and it's contributing to a larger database. But the best part is that everybody has complete access to that database to explore and learn from it. So on Ebert's website, they have a view and explore data tab and this allows you to access that database in a nice clean method. So you can go and say, let's look at the line graphs. And we can ask any kind of question based off of um, what species we want to look at and what region and what time frame. So I decided to ask a question around five different species, the bald eagle, the northern mockingbird, the yellow warbler, the northern cardinal, and the red winged blackbird. And I specifically focus on the Texas region. Now looking at the slime map, it may be a little difficult potentially with the colors, but we have our bald eagle here on the left, then the northern mockingbird in green, a yellow warbler in bright blue, a northern cardinal in olive green gray, and a red winged blackbird in a darker gray. Now based off this data, I can see, you know, the bald eagle in general, it's not that common in Texas. And you can see Texas is the location is up here at the top, and that's where you can change location if you'd like to. But the bald eagle really isn't seen that often in Texas because our y-axis is the frequency, and our x-axis is time, so January to December, left to right. Now compare that to our northern cardinals and northern mockingbirds, which roughly 50% of checklists are reporting a northern cardinal or northern mockingbird um, throughout the year. So drastically, there's a great big difference. But if you look, we have our yellow warbler, and we see nice two big humps. And this is a great opportunity for kids to start doing data interpretation analysis. Based off of this graph, we can see, you know, the northern cardinal and northern mockingbird are fairly common. The bald eagle is not very common, and we do have a migratory species, the yellow warbler which comes through Texas, doesn't seem to nest here at all during the summer, but does fly through, for, through the spring and the fall. So again, these are just opportunities for them to be able to uh, analyze and interpret data through citizen science databases. Now this is just the line graph. We also have a bar chart opportunity. So again, we're gonna look through just a slightly different visual. And this time we're going to talk about, um, we'll talk about which birds, uh, I actually can't see the question. There we go. Which birds of prey might I see in California? So if we want to look around here, we can see, you know, the turkey vulture is fairly common. The cooper's hawk is common. Red-shouldered hawk is fairly common. The red-tailed hawk is common. And I'm saying those are fairly common because our green bars are showing and indicating frequency. Now, the higher the green bar, the more likely it is to see them. Compare that to say a Mississippi kite. We can see a Mississippi kite here is only seen a couple months very infrequently. Same with the California condor, only seen on a rare occasion, which makes sense being an endangered species. We can also, again, look for migratory trends. Our sharp-shinned hawk here in top area is really present during the winter times, but not so much in the summer times here. So it must be a migratory species where it's not actually nesting in um, California. And again, this is all around data analysis and interpretation. We've had students utilize the databases of eBird to better understand how bird populations are changing um, before and after an event. 
So one popular example is from seventh and eighth graders in um, Tualatin, Oregon. Now those educate those students, they had housing development start to be built in their area. And they noticed after the housing development came in, they started to see an increased number of house sparrows. So they were able to analyze the database to see that prior to the housing development, there were hardly any house sparrows present and seen with eBird. Afterwards, they actually had such a spike and increase in house sparrows. And they were able to make that connection um, biologically because house sparrows are adapting more for urban areas and tend to go more towards the urban areas for all type. So these are all opportunities. Say it would be, personally, I'd be very fascinated to see what's happening with bird populations uh, with Hurricane Matthew and how that's impacting bird populations right now before and afterwards as well. So these are all opportunities um, to explore and annotate, or sorry, explore and, <laughs> I just touched the annotate button, um, explore different data. Now, what I'd like to do is we've gone through a lot of content. Um, thanks for being troopers and sticking there with me. But I would like to open this up to you guys now in the chat window and discuss how might this work in your classrooms or programs. Um, especially if you are an informal educator or a formal classroom teacher, um, just try and mention, you know, I'm an informal educator who works with this audience or I work on classroom teacher with this age group. Um, that might be able to help. So you might be able to start some discussions with other people in your, your same field. But I'd love to open this up to you guys now to start brainstorming and reflecting on how might investigating evidence work in your classroom or program. Now that being said, I think it's also worthwhile, we will share the investigating evidence curriculum link in the chat window too. It's a free download, or if Kelly shared it recently. Okay, it is a free download on our website. It's a full curriculum kit. Um, we provide a bunch of supportive PowerPoints and webinars, but I do, do highly recommend it. Yes, changing how you phrase a question will really alter how kids respond. That's a great idea, Travis. And Katie, we know it's a lot of work for you. Um, for those of you who are interested in all about having student work published, Katie is actually one of our dedicated teachers who gets her work published in our Birds with Investigator magazine on a yearly basis. And though it is a lot of work, Katie, it is well worth it. Your students produce quite some marvelous um, scientific studies and artwork. Yeah, Karen, that'd be great to see the study of feral cats and how that's interested in the birds and bird behavior. In case you were, um, have heard, the State of the Birds report that was published, I believe in 2014, I believe it's 2014 publication, um, they actually studied the indicators for birds and what's uh, leading to population decline. Now, habitat loss is the number one cause for population decline, but the next big cause are cats. And majority of that is due to feral cat population. So seeing as that is the second biggest factor for bird population declines, I think that'd be marvelous. Sharing that response with kids. Um, we, we do what we call migration obstacle course where we have um, all the migratory obstacles like bad weather, habitat loss, um, cities, lights, power lines, cats, all be present in a huge obstacle course. And having the kids play cats, and especially being feral cat populations where they just roam free in the city, you can greatly see when birds, birds being the students, try and migrate through, they really do have a, 
quite a bit of challenge escaping the feral cat population. Great, Gwen. I love the fact that you have regular um, writing op opportunities for them to write down their I wonder questions. It's having that accessible throughout the entire class period is really important. Yeah, Naomi, this does allow a more personalized opportunity. What really makes this inquiry and in citizen science work is it's all about motivating the students by asking and answering their own questions. It's not just a, a strict set of, here's what you're doing, here's the protocol you follow, here's the cookie cutter answer, but they get to tailor everything to what their own desires are. Great, so it looks like there's definitely a lot of great discussion happening. The other thing I'd like to, uh, another question I'd like to pose to you guys are what types of questions do you think your students will be interested in? Um, I know some of you talked about the feral cat population, feeding birds is a common one that we often see, but we do like to challenge people and students to try and think past just um, a common feeder example. Think more of the feral cats or, um, Kelly, what have been some of your favorite bird study questions? Put you on the spot. <laughs> I've just been really impressed by the way that people are able to tailor the questions. I'm thinking particularly of the one kindergarten class that was able to do an inquiry project because of the way that the question uh, was handled. So they were looking at the number of birds that came to certain types of um, seed at the feeders instead of the types of birds. So they were able to use their counting skills to answer an inquiry question. So I've been really impressed by the, the projects that come in and, and the way that they are handled by and facilitated by the teachers to yeah. make them really appropriate for different ages. Yeah, I can't think of a favorite question off the top of my head. But. Yeah, there was one that came to the top of my head of the hummingbird. Of the hummingbird, uh, I believe it was a seventh grade girl asked about, it was published in her 2015 publication actually, where she knew about global climate change and wanted to predict how that would impact energy requirements for hummingbirds. Mm. I won't give away the results. You're going to have to download Birds to the Investigator 2015 to find out. <laughs> but that was a really fascinating question. Yeah, Sadell, I'm sorry you're joining an hour late, but we do have this webinar recorded and this will also be repeated on Thursday at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. Raydell, I like the fact that you're talking about the relevancy of making sure the kids understand um, what they're seeing in their own communities as being very important. And that's why we like citizen science. You don't have to have citizen science on such a large scale. It can be on a very small scale where it's just truly a local community project um, around a specific watershed or a specific township. How does weather affect the kinds of birds seen? Yep, that's a good one, Margaret. Yeah, the, the Hawaiian bird situation, it kind of breaks my heart a little bit of what's going on. Um, I actually studied abroad in New Zealand for quite some time, and so familiar with endemic versus, oh, I'm pronouncing it right, <laughs> um, endemic versus invasive and non-invasive. It's just a whole, whole hot mess with mm -hmm. islands. Well, I'm glad I pronounced it right. I don't know. <laughs> I got lucky on that one. So we are going to wrap up. I really encourage you guys to continue thinking about how might investigating the evidence work in your curriculum. Prior to us finishing up, I would ask you guys to quickly take one poll. I should have just theoretically launched the poll in your windows. It's the first time I'm doing it, hopefully it works. All of these will be anonymous, um, but it's a way for us to evaluate uh, 
um, it's a way for us to evaluate these webinars. And I'm realizing, how would you recommend this? Would you recommend this webinar to a friend or it should say colleague after that? Does it? Okay, it doesn't say online. That's unusual. Oh, okay, good. Um, but yes, the more uh, feedback you're welcome to provide us. Uh, unfortunately, with Zoom, we aren't actually allowed to provide open-ended questions. So I do welcome you that if you are interested in taking more webinars, please send us an email. Um, you can contact us via uh, through our website. Just let us know what your thoughts are, how we can improve these webinars, and hopefully you'll join us going further. Now, if you are very interested in inquiry and citizen science, the next step, aside from downloading investigating evidence, is to go further with our new course called Integrating Inquiry for Educators, Developing Sci Student Science Practices. And this is a new course, it's my baby. I took a long time to create this and I'm very proud of it. But the wonderful part about this is investigating evidence is essentially the textbook, but we provide you the opportunities to discuss with other educators, to um, get narrated videos and posters, have a lot of online interaction and quizzes, interactive quizzes and discussions, assignments, and um, continuing education units are available if you do need those for your work site. But I do recommend if you are interested in developing your skills for the, further as an educator around inquiry, then integrating inquiry for educators is your next step. So I'm gonna have Kelly share the link to that course in the discussion if she hasn't already. Do She'll do it again, um, and that will be the next big step for you. Now, aside from that, we will take any questions you may have. Again, please complete that poll for us. It lets us understand and better serve you guys and your educational needs. We'll take any questions you have in the chat window, and please feel free to keep in touch with us. We are on social media with Twitter and Facebook. Um, all of our resources are, can be found on our website, birdsleuth.org, and you're always welcome to email us at birdsleuth at cornell.edu. Kelly and myself are the two that respond in the email. Um, so any questions you have, if you want to brainstorm ideas of how to go further with implementing inquiry and scientific investigations, we're always happy to troubleshoot those with you. Um, it actually livens up our day. So please feel free to reach out to us. And one final note before I forget anything, if you would like the recording to this webinar, please also email us um, and we will provide the recording to you within the next couple of days, probably by Friday or so. So with that, I'll start taking questions in the chat window. Hi, Margaret. I believe we did ask everyone, but we will continue yeah. to remind people in the future. Yeah, I, I didn't uh, notice as the responses were coming in, so it's a okay. great tip to keep aware yes, of. Yes, thank you, Margaret, for that. And Adele, we will be at NST Minneapolis. Um, actually, that is going to be a big conference for us. I believe we have six sessions at NST Minneapolis, including some on inquiry. And... Oh, we're giving away bird feeders. That's right. Yeah. If you are attending either NST in Minneapolis or NST Portland, come see us. So we will be giving away bird feeders. It's wonderful. Um, so yes, please do that. And actually, can you share the Minneapolis uh, event? Because that will have all the sessions that are available. Are there any other questions? I know it's about five minutes before we schedule to end. Kelly or I will hang out for a little bit longer. Um, again, feel free to email us any questions you have. Please share your stories with us. If you guys do your own investigations or inquiry projects with the kids you work with, share that with us because it is wonderful. We love your, we love your stories and we can also get you your students hopefully published in versus investigator magazine Barbara what I just said about bird feeders um, 
we are giving away classroom window bird feeders at NSTA Minneapolis and NSTA Portland. You can find those two events on our website. Kelly just shared the NSTA Minneapolis event. Um, NSTA, for those who aren't familiar, is National Science Teachers Association. Um, Adele, Thursday, we will be doing the webinar at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And again, if by chance you can't attend that, just let us know. We'll be happy to share you the recording. Katie, Birds and Investigator Magazine is at the printer's right now. It's almost half at the press. Um, I'm actually, it's on my to-do list tomorrow morning to put it live on our website. So your students will be published authors very shortly. Barbara, um, so to participate in NST Minneapolis or NST Portland, you actually have to be present. However, actually, I just got this news as well. If you download our Feathered Friends resources, we are distributing classroom bird feeders that way. We are doing that. I just got confirmation. Um, if you have questions, again, we have a lot of people questions and answers right now. You can just email us, again, birdsooth at cornell.edu, and I can send you a message um, about how to get those bird feeders. Travis, yes, please just email us um, and we'll be happy to send you a formal confirmation letter. And then Gwen as well, um, please just email us and we can send you a recording of the ELA webinar too. Just email us everyone. We, we greatly appreciate emails. It keeps us busy, <laughs> even though there's too much to do already. Yes, the, the, we actually prefer your emails over other work emails. Are there any other questions? Again, the best way to keep up to date with all this information um, is to follow us on Facebook or uh, sign up for our e-news. The email address is on the screen right now, but it's birdsleuth at cornell.edu. <laughs> No worries, Adele. It's it's uh it's late at night here for us. It's past my bedtime. It's almost my bedtime. <laughs>